Um, over the past 20 years, um, Danny has used painting, video, uh, installation and public art to explore uh, ideas of portraiture uh, and sexuality um, through the lens of modernism or minimalism or uh, geometric abstraction. Um, Danny has two uh, really significant works in this exhibition, uh, a painting from his uh, Pleasure Chest series, as well as one of his ambitious video installations, uh, a work called Notes for Bob. Uh, together, these works um, bracket, I think, some of the enduring ideas and approaches uh, that have circulated in uh, Danny's work since 2004. Um, the paintings speak to a kind of expanded portraiture um, and perhaps the embodiment of uh, encounters and people through materials and processes. And at the same time, the videos are um, uncompromising in their very honest examination of power, um, of vulnerability, of care and of pleasure. So Danny, I wanted to start tonight by uh, going back and revisiting uh, something that uh, a colleague of both of us, Lisa Slade, uh, said a few years ago when your work was shown in uh, the Adelaide Biennial. I think that's when it was said, uh, but she made this uh, interesting statement that's always stayed with me uh, with your work. She said that uh, in the work of Danny Marty, the ultimate medium is intimacy. Um, would you say that that is correct? I think it's correct. I mean, that became has become very obvious in my video practice, that's for sure. And also in my relationship with the two dimensional sculptural painting medium as well. Um, so, yeah, there's a very strong closeness and claustrophobic feeling to both mediums when I'm approaching them. Uh -huh. So in terms of a, a driving like force that perhaps underpins the practice, um, you're interested in human relationships, yep. you're interested <clears throat> in intimacy and you're interested in, 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 in people. Um, what, are, what are some of the other kind of, I guess, um, drivers for, for how you've approached your practice? In terms of, you summarise very well, in terms of the video practice, very well, and also with the, uh, my other practice, more three-dimensional practice, there's these, those components, intimacy as well, in terms of portraiture, or history, uh, the body, but also materiality. I'm very obsessed with materials and surface. Mm -hmm. And having these, I call that almost like, it's, it's almost like a Baroque surface, minimalism. Mm -hmm. So it's all those emotional feeling or component attached to the surface, to the wall and painting. Mm -hmm. the work. So let's start with <clears throat> um, uh, the uh, painting practice. Yep. Um, and we have a really wonderful work in the show from the Pleasure Chest um, series. Um, and let's start with the fact that you use everyday materials and you use techniques like weaving and macrame. I wonder if you could um, tell us a little bit about how you came to working with these materials and working in this way with those sure. materials. <clears throat> Everything started when I was, I think I was about seven years old, really uh -huh. that back. Uh, at school, they show us how to do macrame. So I started going crazy to get my crappy belts, foot hanger, things like that. So I love the notion of just one thread, be able to create that surface. So of course, puberty kicked in, put everything aside, and uh, went to uni, and then in my late 20s, started painting. So I was a very bad painter, but I was very always obsessed with texture, texture. So I consciously went back to those materials that I was using when I was eight, seven years old, also the age of 13, 14, I was doing tapestry. So I went back to those materials, rows, and uh, to paint with those materials instead of using paint. So instead of uh, painting on canvas, I was weaving the canvas. And in the process of weaving the canvas, I was embedding some message or emotional component, or there was since the performance of the artist within making the work. And also, also always, always referring to a particular person or emotion or state. So was there a moment where you uh, you decided to make this kind of flip from um, from you know painting with conventional um, you know materials, uh, to, and that you had some kind of recollection of the way that you used to use materials in a different way, yeah. and that you actually you know tried that, or what was the, what was the moment that you, you you made that kind of leap between 
um, um, you know, painting in a conventional way to working with um, these materials? Um, I look at my work at the time, it was very ordinary. I mean, mm -hmm. nothing special. And always at that time, we just started making our project story to be, okay, I want to be something specific or special or bringing in something new. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then I started to say, oh, go back to those materials. So oh, oh, it took me back straight away to that energy, pre pre-prevescence, uh, playful with those materials. So I felt very comfortable so, with those industrial materials, materials that I used to make my artworks, mm -hmm. like uh, ropes or reflectors or mm -hmm. necklaces. Mm -hmm. And you do refer to them as, as paintings and not as textiles or material assemblages. You do think of them as paintings. Um, the beginning was paintings, 100%. Mm -hmm. And I'm starting to relax about it. So I call uh -huh. them woven, constru woven constructions. Woven constructions. Woven constructions. And, uh, but I suppose because there was a strong ref reference always to the the way it was framed within the frame, woven onto a frame. So I wanted to bring that history of painting within the wall construction. Mm -hmm. So either way. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. And of course, you know, as you said, um, the subject of these works is often, um, uh, you know, portraits of family or, or of lovers or of friends. Uh, and so there is this sense that there is an incredible intense bond that you have with the subject yeah. of your work <clears throat> that also plays out in the physicality of making these yeah. works. Yeah. So I imagine you alone in the studio. Um, and when you look at the construction of some of these works, um, they're, uh, they're highly detailed and they, they, um, they uh, possess a kind of intense physicality. Yeah. Um, so do you think that, is there a correlation to you between perhaps the emotion or affection that you have for the subject um, and the process of making the work? Yeah, I think it happened by accident a little bit. Um, I remember I started making those, started making those woven works a little bit. And I remember a friend of mine, architect at the time, was pretty hot in Sydney. He said, oh, I'm going to come and look at your work. I said, I have to make a new work. So I have to build up this relationship with this architect, a friend of mine. I want to make a work inspired by that person. I want to. So there was a sense of I want to capture here you know, a sense of bondage, trying to create this bondage between the subject I was referring to and the process of making. Or it's like the grandmother knitting the jumper mm -hmm. and the jumper with the grandson. So there's a very strong, almost ritual, ritual thing mm -hmm. happening there between that surface, the emotion is put into that surface, and the portrait of the grandson, in that case, to the person I'm referring to. So after that, architect started to inspire my neighbor, my mother, and uh, people I used to have sex with. And uh, so, what's for me was a starting point. I wanted to have some narrative behind these abstracted, uh, almost form, very formal surfaces. Mm -hmm. I think the analogy of the grandmother knitting, yeah. um, or the mother knitting, or someone preparing something for a loved one is is, is really lovely. Um, the interesting thing about these works is also um, not only the uh, materiality and the process of making them, but the um, the kind of uh, pre-production and the way that you collect materials. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about? Because I know that within this particular body of work, the pleasure chest, um, you know, uh, there might have been. A, a number of years of collecting um, the beads and jewellery that would end up forming those paintings. Um, so do you want to talk a little bit about how you kind of work outside of making the work in terms of collecting? You know, is it something that you just pop into charity yeah. stores yeah. on your weekends? Plenty, or? plenty, plenty of them. Um, that series the, is called The Pleasure Chest and Mother. Okay. Yeah. And The Pleasure Chest is the big one. And um, I did these square ones called Mother. Mm -hmm. So the whole process started with again looking at beads and then the history behind each bead. So be behind each necklace is a story of a woman or a wearer. And so I started the series with Mother. So it was this very strange, very collective portraiture on these woven surfaces with all the necklaces, second hand necklaces. Uh, so this is like this collective portraiture. And then I started with the place of chase, so it's more, much more ample, like a landscape. At the same time, I was doing that as well. I was referring to is the notions of the mother, but also sexuality. And uh, and the for the place of chase, it was like connotations of the signifier or how to wear a necklace and what it signifies mm -hmm. for a gay person. And um, 
Yeah, so it's in the pro in the process. The work is about the collecting, then the assembly. It's both both ways. Mm -hmm. Both things go together, and how you establish relationship with people in the charity shops, mm -hmm. uh, with collecting collecting those. And how does that maybe differ? Because obviously there are, there are works that you make that are with um, uh, like found materials, yeah. And then there are works that you have made which are with I guess um, industrial elements that you might source from yeah. a from a fabricator. Yeah. So is there? Do you think about the works differently based on the source material or? They have a for me. They have a different meaning. I mean, uh, when I use like industrial reflectors or industrial robes, and uh, the work. Okay, I'm moving more into realm of portraiture still, but it's more of minimalism, formalism. So the robe itself it doesn't convey too much meaning. Sometimes when I use uh, the necklaces, there is a lot of meaning really embedded within the work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, so yeah, um, the the making process or the process is different from one depends on the material I'm mm -hmm. using. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting, you know, when you think about the idea of uh, um, uh, a pleasure chest, um, I immediately think of this play between the the chest of of, right, of, yeah, of, yeah. of the wearer, yeah. um, as well as this kind of figurative box that's filled with treasures. Um, but I'm also struck by this perhaps this idea of like. Um, devotion and in a way um, whilst they're necklaces that you might also read them as rosary beads or they might have some other kind of quality to them so I wondered if uh, and this might be you know a bit of a wild thought but I wondered if you're are you interested in ideas of the sacred in some way whether it might be uh, in relation to geometry or um, or the kind of pageantry of of of, um, of religion in some way is that something that interests you? No, but I mean, I'm a Catholic. I mean, so a Catholic background, so I'm sure that is affecting me somehow. Um, but I don't. No, I don't. I'm not very. No, I don't see that connection with religion too much. Mm -hmm. um, I suppose I can see that more. There's more that sacred side to it when I start doing those more work with the grids mm -hmm. in the woven works mm -hmm. and uh, this sense of just meditative space, mm -hmm. very. It's very formal, very undefined space, mm -hmm. but at the same time, there's all that energy behind. But would you be looking at sacred geometry at all? Is that a reference point in the? Well, I haven't thought about it, but yeah, I can relate to that. Okay, and I don't want to talk. Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, the other thing that um, the work speaks to, and you uh, alluded to this, is this idea of a collective body, right? Yeah. So it's not just one owner; it's um, potentially hundreds of um, oh, relationships. Yeah, yeah. Of yeah. previous owners that yeah. are embedded in this work, and I think. Maybe I read somewhere that there's um, perhaps the suggestion that there might be um, uh, hair or other elements that are within these chains. Well, uh, yeah, it could be. I mean, yeah. sometimes I mean, sometimes you pick up those beads, beads or necklaces, still you can smell the wear. Yeah, the perfume, uh, skin. Yeah, um, I haven't come across hair yet. Yeah, but you can smell the perfume. Yeah, um, yeah. There's a sense, there's a sense of the wear there. Yeah. Do you want to maybe talk a little bit about how you make it? Because in some sure. in some way. I think people can also can approach these works sometimes and and imagine that they are um, made spontaneously, you know, almost like a kind of um, yeah, that they're made spontaneously. But in fact, they're actually um, quite a long process. Process, yeah. Yeah, yeah. What I do is like, okay, I've got the frame. Mm -hmm. So I'm talking like that. I'm very hands on. Okay, so I've got the frame, and then I put a grid. It's just this mesh used for farming muscles, mm -hmm. right? So you clip on things like a tubular mesh, but it helps me to push the bead between the mesh and they get stuck. So I've got these grids, okay, so starting with the grid, and they start really attaching necklaces onto the grid. So it's a matter of, there's nothing, it's a transparent grid behind. So it's a matter of layering layers and layers and layers until the whole thing becomes dense. Mm -hmm. And it's, I guess that people might not also know that you do make most of these works uh, yeah. alone, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, about 80% of the works, you have to do them alone. Uh, alone. Sometimes I get a helper. Yeah. The, uh, one helper. If I have to do, uh, yeah, for different work for some of the melted reflected ones. But in general, I mean, this show I've got here now, you yeah. see it, the whole thing done myself. And that one is on my hand as well. Yeah. How many works are in that pleasure chest series? The pleasure chest, I've got one, four of them. Four of them. Okay, I've got the black and white, and one, I've got one is all black, mm -hmm. and then I've got another one is all white, mm -hmm. and then I've got another one, it's all done with wooden 
wooden beads, mm -hmm. mainly from the 70s, necklaces from the 70s. Sorry, mm -hmm. so the whole thing is wood. Mm -hmm. But one of the things I immediately thought of when I saw that work was um, the now closed uh, sex shop. Um, is, it, is it closed? Uh, is it? Well, it's certainly closed right. on Oxford Street. Oxford, so there was yeah. a very famous one on yeah, Oxford yeah, Street, yeah, which, yeah. Uh, which had also yeah. the black and white yeah. um, logo. Yeah. Um, was that? Yeah, I had that in mind when I was yeah. doing this last one, particularly. I have that in mind about the logo, the very black and white logo. Yeah. And uh, so in the whole, well, I was making the whole thing, I was thinking about the sexual industry. Yeah. And so there is, there is this kind of sexual energy in the work. Um, and because I mean, the other thing that made me think of as well was the sort of um, detritus of all the necklaces that are thrown during the New Orleans Mardi Gras, right? This kind of, this sort of like the leftover kind of, um, yeah. um, um, signs of, of reckless abandonment, right? Um, so I'm really interested in this sexual energy that's sometimes very, very present in the work. And I know that um, you've got a show on at the moment at uh, Dominic Mersch, um, and you've revisited um, uh, a work called Sad Captain, um, which, is a, which is a really interesting and unique work within your body of work. Um, and um, it's called, the new work is called The Last Days of Disco, in parentheses, My Sad Captain. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that particular work and, and the idea of sexual energy in your work? Sure. Um, for example, if I, you look at the necklace work, so the, um, uh, the place of chest for me is a very, I've got all that sexual uh, minimalism. Um, so it's all that, the way it's done, referring to sex, it's all that sexuality. Um, when I do some of the woven works, the paintings I've done with the grid, it's a totally different thing altogether. We're going more into a sacred, more sacred meditative space. And uh, for this work I'm here showing, for example, at the Dominic Merch Gallery, and uh, that's like, okay, the ropes are jumping, um, jumping out from the frame and they're just so expressing themselves. I mean, that work, uh, I started making the sad captain, a, a single piece, of a uh, single piece, and that was inspired on a video I made of uh, a friend of mine uh, about his sexuality, and that's called uh, Bacon Stock video mm -hmm. and uh, so he talked about I forgot the name of the uh, the poets and he took the that uh, a title from my sad captain and he could he referred himself as my sad captain some idea had experienced my sexuality at all in the 60s mm -hmm. and then opened up within the video mm -hmm. and uh, so that was inspiring him I mean that uh, the single one piece and with the ends all embedded with pearls at the end this sense of loneliness sitting there by itself. When we're going back to this work I've done now here at the Dominic Merch Gallery, it's like these totally different energies, just this mess of energies uh, in, in time, in twine, in twine, mm -hmm. <laughs> in twine. And so it's, for me, it's a very, for me, that, for me personally, it speaks a very sexualized space. And then almost there's a sense of anxiety for me. Mm -hmm. And the work sitting like in this plinth, like a disco plinth. And so you've got all these, for me, they're just like single members of people. And uh, so they're just like this sense of entwinedness, things like that. And the title refers to the last days of sing disco. It's like, I suppose it's a little bit of portrait here as well, self portrait. Uh, it's like saying more or less, um, I think my days of disco, they're over. And uh, even my own sexuality is slowing down big time. Mm -hmm. And so let's place homage to that moment where we are. Uh, I am, uh, I am personally. And uh, the, so that's, yeah, this is in the portrait as well. That mm -hmm. but as well, very sexualized. Mm -hmm. Well, sticking with that theme is probably a good intro to um, perhaps the most, um, um, the, the works that deal the most with sexuality, and that is your video practice. Yeah. Um, and, um, um, the work that we have, Notes of Bob, is a really affecting piece and I think it would be good to sort of unpack um, the different elements of it because at one level the work deals with the sort of ethics of the camera and of the artist. It deals with these um, ideas of voyeurism, of empathy um, and, um, and care. Um, um, and, and ultimately, in a way, your, your your need to find deeper connections outside of the studio and working in this solitary way, making the paintings. Um, I read an interview um, uh, uh, where I think it was perhaps in the early 2000s where you talked about this kind of moment of making the shift 
to working with um, um, video and that you'd had this kind of urge to go somewhere deeper um, and to go somewhere uncomfortable and challenging for yourself. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you came to, to working with um, video. Um, I started practicing very late mm -hmm. in the year. Uh, my first year was 1999 and then I started making the woman works about portraiture and things like that. And by 2003, four I started to feel a bit comfortable. Um, I, I wanted to try with new medium mm -hmm. um, and explore these. I didn't, I didn't know what to do with the camera, but I needed I had to do some, something with the camera. So I just left Sydney and then I went to Glasgow, to Glasgow School of Art to do an MFA. And I picked up my camera for the first time and a little camera. Um, without not really knowing what, what to do. Um, so I put aside all my ropes, my reflectors, everything, and then had the camera. One of the first videos I did was uh, um, David's. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was in the streets, uh, had a little camera, and there was this person there asking for, a the homeless person, asking there for money with a little Coca-Cola cup in the street. So I went to the guy, and it was raining, it was cold, it was in November, he was like a shopping center. I went to the guy, I said, look, my name is Danny, I'm an artist, do you mind if I film you? So he said to me, what do you want me to do? I said, nothing, just ignore me, I'm here next to you. And I'll, I'll give you some money, uh, have my cup, and I want you to be with you. And uh, so I was there with the camera, and uh, filming him when he was drifting in and out of consciousness, falling asleep, it was cold. So it was interesting to see the interaction of the different people in the public towards me for the fact that I was filming him. And from thanking me or accusing me, uh, so what's interesting the the notion of having a camera just in front of that person or that thing that we see all the time, how it changes all the power, mm -hmm. the power and how the power is perceived. Um, so I started really getting start shooting and then bringing as well this obsession with intimacy within the video practice, and uh, that's how the whole thing started developing. Uh, I used to I went a lot on. Uh, Deadlines uh, at the time, uh, Gaydar, mm -hmm. at the time, the beginning of the Gaydar. So, through the whole process of Gaydar, I said, Look, uh, wanting to, through the whole camera as uh, an intimacy, as a vehicle, to get closer to the person, trying to get something very intimate, very, very deep uh, through those two minutes intimacy and the camera. Mm -hmm. And that's how I started making all those different projects. So after Glasgow, um, you had an opportunity to go to New York City as part of yeah. uh, an Australia Council residency. You had the studio, right? In yes, I did. Yeah. So tell me, um, this is where you made the work, but yes. I'm, I'm assuming you perhaps didn't necessarily go there with the intention of making the work, but it's something that emerged in your time there. Um, do you want to kind of like walk through um, what it was that took you to uh, New York and, and and how it is that you came to meet uh, the subject of this work, uh, Bob? Yeah, um, before I went to New York, I think it was 2012, and went to uh, Edinburgh, I still gathered, I did a residency project, and then it was, I did these uh, projects and these residency talking about the ethics of portraiture, the ethics of the camera, the sorry, the ethics of the encounter. And uh, so I did a few projects just pushing this, 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 that notion, that idea. And I was the ethics of filming. And I was, at the time in Scotland, I was uh, looking for a volunteer, a blind person, to be filmed into quite an intimate context. But I find it very hard to find volunteers in Scotland. So I went to New York. I went to New York, got the, the, the res two residency um, because I was going to have a show there in New York. That, the end thing happens, but I still have these. Uh, I want to research more, investigate, explore more the whole notions of ethics. So I went online and I typed blind New York uh, gay, you know, on Google, and then Bob pop up. And um, so he's got a translator for the computer. So I spoke to Bob and I said to him, Look, I'm a visual artist, I'd like to film in an intimate way, if it's possible, to me, things like that. So I took it back, back and forth, we spoke about for two weeks. He freaked out, he said no, yes. And then towards the end, he said to me, okay, come to me, but uh, I want you to come as a prostitute 
I'll give you some money, some fees, so I'll have control of the space. So yeah, don't bring your camera. And uh, so come to my place and then we'll take it from there. So I had no idea about Bob or what to expect or anything like that. So I went there to Bob and uh, I met him and uh, he lives in a very small little apartment in Brooklyn, as you can see in the video. And uh, he's, he lives on his own. So I met him, Bob, and he said to me, OK, I want you to do sing notes for me. That's my sexuality. Um, I'm not interested in your genitals or exchange or fucking. It's just about the sound of the voice. And that's the most intimate thing for me, my understanding. Um, so we spent for about an hour and a half. I was there with him. And then he asked me two things. He asked me, first of all, to hold him, hug him. And he he liked his feeling to be held, to be held, 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 to be held, to feel secure. So if I didn't hold it the way you can see on the screen, uh, he would he would have fallen. So he needed that sense of really to be high protection. And the other thing he wanted me to do is to sing those partic that particular notes mm -hmm. that he would record. Okay, he had tons of tapes. He would record and then he would listen to those tapes and he will masturbate to the sound of the voice. I mean, Bob was, really parenthesis, and Bob, he was a premature baby, and he was put in the incubator when he was very young. Oh, sorry, then he born uh, premature, and then there was too much oxygen in the incubator, and that killed his eyes. So he's never seen, he's never seen, uh, he's never seen anything. So his whole concept of body, sexuality, intimacy, is totally, he's got his own parameters or his study which was. Mm -hmm. And so part of this work is not only um, documenting this exchange that you have with Bob, um, but there is this kind of um, active, uh, uh, a, a, a kind of secondary uh, exchange that occurs. And uh, part of what the installation um, shows here is um, a series of um, video portraits that you've made of a series of volunteers who came to your studio to also sing these notes, right? Uh, and that you recorded these notes for Bob as a kind of um, a kind of audio archive uh, for him. Do you want to talk about that part of the process and where did the idea of that come from? Yeah, I was talking to Bob and he allowed me to document my exchange, me singing to him, and then to have that very quite intimate moment with him in his place. And then he said to me, look, I find it so hard to find volunteers. He said, if I had so much money, if I had a lot of money, I would, I would pay a different opera singers to come here and sing that particular note to me. Mm -hmm. I recall that. So I said to him, look, Bob, as part of my project, I'm happy to be, to be your eyes outside and to be your hands outside. Um, so I'm happy for you to become my pimp. Mm -hmm. And uh, so let me go out there and search for people to sing that particular note for you outside in New York and I said to them in exchange of for them just for the experience to the experience to get involved in the project or even the exchange of me having sex with them in exchange for you for them to sing the note for you. Mm -hmm. So I started looking for these volunteers in different uh, through the yoga HIV positive yoga group I had with that was going there in New York and from up in the in a gay newspaper and I put another ad saying, yeah, to a couple of gay newspapers online. So I end up getting all those 21 volunteers. And so the age from 17 to I think it was 162, mm -hmm. 62 years old. And uh, like the one you can see now, he was also almost blind as well. And, uh, and not necessarily singers. They're not, they're not singers. So what I had to do is to teach them exactly that particular note mm -hmm. and to hold it for as long as you, as you, as you could. And the secret for Bob, I just understood that bit later on, the secret for him is like, he wanted you to sing that for me. I did sign for him a few times. He wanted me to sing as far as long as I could until I ran out of air. It's like, uh, and he liked that moment of control. Absolutely. And there's a, there's a really uh, incredible scene in the video yeah. um, where uh, you do it once and then he asks you to do it again. Oh, no, no. He was pushy. Yeah. Oh, very pushy. Yeah. That was good. It was great. Yeah. It, was, it was these very, it felt like a bonded sexual. He was possessing me through the really running up there to those to the end, really to push that note for as long as I could. Mm. There's such a um, uh, incredible 
um, very uh, powerful interplay of, of power that goes on between Bob, you, between you and the subjects of um, of uh, that coming into the studio, and then this kind of strange psychic link that occurs between uh, those men who've never met Bob um, and Bob who come together in the installation. So when you come to see the work, um, the it comprises a, a kind of central documentary that documents the uh, um, that documents Bob's life, his story, and then your encounter with him. Uh, and then the suite of video portraits of these naked men who, who in a sense, watch over this whole, uh, this whole scene. And then at various intervals um, between the documentary, uh, three screens um, are illuminated with extracts of the audio recording, but also the video of these men performing these uh, notes. Um, so it's a really incredible, powerful play of um, of um, people and um, and desire. Danny, thank you for um, for taking us through uh, both those projects. Um, there's an opportunity now for us to take um, some questions from uh, from uh, viewers who are tuning in, um, and I'm going to because I'm getting a little old and my eyes are <laughs> a little weak. I'm going to lean in a little closer to see these uh, questions. So, Danny, the first one is. Um, do you think the act of making the um, art slash work yourself is an important part of your practice and process as opposed to outsourcing and not being hands on with the production? Um, I think I think particularly with the yeah, I think it's important. It is important. I mean, some of the works I've done even with the reflective works or you know, the road works, I want them to look almost like I have this very industrial, almost manufactured look quite slick, but at the same time, when you get close close to the work, you see that hands-on of, of the artist, the involvement in making the work. And, and for me, look, I love making those works. I mean, for me, I just love getting into that headspace of spending hours and hours and days of working on pieces. Um, sometimes I feel like I wish I could have a big work it would take me about three years or two years to weave, so I could know, you could know everything, everything around me, and just be there making the work. So I think it's important to, yeah, to be part of present within the work, within the process of making it. It's a, it's an interesting, um, oh, as a way of following on for that. I mean, one of the other things that's really interesting about your video practice is the way that you implicate yourself within um, the the lives of the subjects that you're working with and, and the kind of narrative of, of those works. Uh, and you make yourself actually as vulnerable as the as the subjects in your in your work. Um, so I guess, you know, do you want to talk to that? And, and I guess maybe why you choose to uh, um, to um, include yourself in, in these works. In the term of the video works? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think more. Well, I think that most of the video works is about the exchange of intimacy. It's more about portrait, more of a, than a portrait, but a, a portraiture of exchange. Mm -hmm. So I think me being involved with the subject is very important, and uh, <clears throat> uh, now it's sometimes very uncomfortable. I mean, because sometimes I feel like in this very fine line, okay, how genuine I am, or how how I'm that for the project. So I'm trying to bring to be as sincere as possible to the subject in trying to bring something positive to the subject for the whole experience, but it's always a risk. Um, so the work is important for me to be within the works because the works about the exchange. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting in a way that you have stopped making video, yeah. right? So the last work was shown in um, in Newcastle at the, at the lockup a couple of years ago now? No, I think it was 20... I think 2018, 2018 or 17, something like that. Okay, three years ago, something like that. So you stopped making video. Do you want to talk about that? I'm done. You're done? I'm done with video. No, I'm done. A little bit. Um, I find the whole process is very, uh, for the work I'm doing is very involved and it's very takes because of energy and then there's a lot of thought process happening. And I think, and also I did that work when my testosterone levels were much higher than now, and so I'm much, much quieter space. Um, and also the dynamics of dealing with 
because I need to, at the time, I was start work, making it work in the studio. I need to, as you said very well, I need to get out of there and experience the intimacy, experience the sexuality, experience all that, all that, all that narrative I need to feed my work, my practice. So I think all that's sitting there behind me somewhere already. And now I feel like, I feel like just being in the studio alone, no much interaction, and just exploring uh, my object making, uh, my, other, my other practice. Mm. So videos, I put video aside, I made the process of selling my camera, mm -hmm. and uh, that's a big step. And then maybe video will come back later on, I don't know when, but it will be totally different, mm. different approach. I think that's I think that's a really powerful uh, thing for an artist to recognize um, the limits of a certain uh, of of an interest in a, in a medium and and in a way of working, um, and and there's no doubt that the um, the intense amount of video that you actually made really in a short mm. period of time as well is extraordinary, uh, and so I'm really um, uh, grateful that we're showing this work, which I think is um, a really important. Um, uh, work within that whole oh, body. I, think of work. I agree. I agree with you. It's um, so thank you, Danny. Oh, and, pleasure. And thank you for being part of this show. It's been uh, a long time coming for the opportunity to work with you a lot closer, and um, we're so thrilled to have your work in this context. Um, I'm very happy to be here with you guys. Thank you, and thank you also to um, those of you who've tuned in uh, tonight. Um, oh, sorry. Actually, there are some further. Uh, uh, questions which are worth asking. Danny, are you still in contact with Bob? Yeah, I'm still in touch with him, not much. And uh, so uh, the last time I spoke to him was maybe about eight months ago. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe I give him a call. Yeah, I give him a call or tell, I'll email him every now and then. But uh, talking about it's, it's it's about the whole context about it. how for how long do you keep in touch with your subjects? Um, but yeah, I'm mean, still in touch with him, but it's hard to keep uh, keep in touch with everybody. Okay, um, given the physicality of your work, uh, how do you avoid RSI? <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> good question. Uh, actually, I was doing this, uh, I think I was doing that work I've got in the studio. So I spent for that work, I spent uh, weeks and weeks doing lots of knots with little um, natural fiber ropes. And so, for the last, no, no, I stopped. I had a long break at the studio because I went overseas. But for about for a year and a half, I was sleeping, sleeping with uh, compression gloves because my hands were so painful. I had a lot of pain at night. But I had a race and then this seemed to be working okay. You have to look after them. Lots of stretching and yoga. 